We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome everybody to the session called uh, Digital Cooperation Process Analysis from Your Lessons. My name is Juan Pajaro Velasque. I'm going to be today your on-site moderator in this panel. We, we are going to have today four speakers. The first of them is Itan Muha Mudabahu. Itan is a regulatory compliance and mark a market intelligence consultant as a partnership at global policy field for front regulatory issues surrounding digital infrastructure, satellite communications, data policies, and the digital economy. Second will be Mary, Mary Badayasayan. Mary Badayasayan is a human rights lawyer from Armenia focusing on digital rights uh, issues at the intersection of law and technology. She recent, recently received a LN degree from the University of Pennsylvania Law School with a concentration in intellectual property and technology law. Currently, she's a legal fellow at Electronic Frontier Foundation. Elaine Sejas. Elaine Sejas is, is a criminal lawyer from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Currently, she is the regional engagement director Latin America and the Caribbean from the Jews Seek Jews Observatory, and the steering committee member from the Jew Coalition on Internet on Internet Government. Her professional background comprises criminal law and the interest of including feminist perspective to law, since since law is still following the patriarchal, the patriarchal mindsets. That is affecting society. She has been involved in different activities on internet governance, such as Jew for Digital Sustainability program, a, a working group in, inter, in internet social cohesion, organizing the mentorship phase of the ISO ambassadorship, and also for the second year, and she is the coordinator of the inclusive internet governance ecosystem and digital cooperation in the project in the project Youth Summit. Finally, Muahir Sargana. He's a he's a resource driver professional who has seven years experience in the field of cybersecurity, and he is the and he is the cybersecurity advisor to Ace. APM on the uh, of the government in Islamabad. He's also one of the founders of the Asia Pacific School on Internet Governance, Pakistan School on Internet Governance, and Internet Governance Forum of Pakistan. He has been managing secretary of uh, Asia Pacific Special Interest Group and Pakistan Special Interest Group and also work as a coordinator of IGS Pakistan. He's currently volunteer and member steering committee for Pakistan C, a member of, a member of Asia Pacific Regional IGF. And also presenting a moderator online who will be assuming today as soon. He's Fred Kudawako Asore. He's an experienced software developer with a particular interest in Python Diego and Diango, AWS, start even through in Excel in C Sharp and SPNet and React. He has a background in computer science and holds a bachelor a bachelor degree from Kuwane New Kang University of Science and Technology in Ghana. He's currently one of the ISOS ambassadors 2021. Now let's jump to the first segment of this conversation where we be discussing the four different digital cooperation 
six uh, digital comparison model uh, in order to where we're heading. Fairly, we're going to hear Eileen Sejas that she will, she will be talking to us about the IGS, IGF plus model. The floor is yours. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Juan. I am Eileen Sejas from Argentina, and I will bring you to you some reflections we have been gathering uh, from the um, IGF plus model, so we can discuss later on Miro. The IGF plus model, as you know, will have four parts mainly the advisory board, the co operation accelerator, the policy incubator, the observatory, and help desk. And uh, this uh, graphic that it's on the slide, hope you can help me with that, uh, is, is missing the leadership panel uh, because as you know, this is something very recent. Um, so about that, I can share some reflections that um, appear on the Diplo website and I will also add some of my own. Um, so regarding uh, the, this leadership panel that we heard about it a couple of weeks, uh, so some advantages that we can find is that it, it could increase the relevance of the AGF because as you know, uh, historically, uh, it had a, a very good uh, coverage on news and everything, but as the years have been passing by, uh, maybe, um, the media is not reflecting uh, as much as it would need it about the discussion that are happening in this forum. So in that way, this uh, leadership panel, uh, as a, it adheres to the core values of the UN, it could definitely be as a salesperson, as uh, it's defined on the uh, Diplo website for the IGF, so more people can join and, and be part of this forum. Uh, other aspect that uh, would be possible, positive is that it could amplify the IGF messages and the expertise. As you know, uh, at each IGF, there is a certain uh, amount of messages, not only from the main sessions, but only from high level um, parliamentarian track. So in that way, it also could uh, bring these messages uh, through a, a wider community. Um, also, uh, other advantage that we can find from this leadership panel is that it could help to connect uh, this body to the UN system and other communities that uh, are doing uh, several important things at the UN, for example, UNESA. Uh, so in that way, we can connect both worlds, if we can uh, say in that way. Um, also, uh, the other advantage uh, would be to increase uh, the level of inclusion within the leadership panel because it would comprise several stakeholders from all the sectors. Um, in that way, it could bring these missing actors into the IGF ecosystem. And the, the last advantage is that it would be reducing the form shopping. Uh, that means that, uh, as you know, at the beginning, uh, well, we had Y, um, sorry, WSIS, um, and then the ITF appears. Uh, but the thing is that um, then we saw this increasing and a very alarming level of a lot of events and forums. So it's, it's very difficult to concentrate uh, the policy making in one place. So um, this leadership panel, what can we do is to map about all the governance processes and bring this transparency into the field. Uh, however, uh, we also see some disadvantages. Uh, for example, is that the leadership panel will be only one aspect of the ATF plus. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, uh, there are other parts of the IGF plus model that we are expecting for updates. Um, for example, the policy incubator that maybe this leadership panel uh, could work on creating some, some policies, not only gathering these recommendations. Um, so that's one of the disadvantages. Um, the other part is that it's not clear yet how this, um, the leadership panel, uh, we, con we contribute to the process towards the development of the digital compact. That 
is expected to be adopted in 2023. Um, well, as, as you might note, uh, the IGF and the digital combat are mentioned on the common agenda. So this is something that we are also expecting to see how the situation will develop. Um, there is also other disadvantage in a way um, that we need more, more clarity on this drafting of policies um, as how is it is a structure right now and the terms of reference of the IGF leadership panel. And also so we can ensure that these outcomes from this group will be uh, inclusive, um, as I was saying, but it could be an, an advantage uh, if it, it's used on, on a good way, but uh, otherwise it would be not so inclusive. Um, so um, I hope I'm good with my time. Um, so there is something that I want to share with you uh, that, for example, at uh, both the multi-stakeholder high-level body that we discussed um, several months ago, um, uh, and both uh, the leadership panel, there is a dimension on the role of youth. And that's something that um, we, we expected to see as youth. Um, I want to share with you, it was part of the points of action that we elaborated on the working group on inclusive internal governance and ecosystem uh, about our concern that there is there wasn't any mention of youth, not even the UN youth envoy, which would, uh, would have been very relevant because as you, as you know, on the description of this leadership panel, it's uh, mentioned about having the UN tech envoy. So that would be to um, make equal this, this level. Um, I will wrap up soon. Um, also, um, on the selection criteria is not including a, a quota of youth representatives. And that's something that we express our concern because it is also related to the UN Common Agenda uh, point number seven on removing barriers to youth participation. Um, we also said at our working group that it's relevant, it would be relevant actually to have youth as a recognized stakeholder, which will allow us to have a better recognition at the IG ecosystem and not the usual tokenism that we are used to see, uh, unfortunately, on these uh, forums. Um, I will just comment very briefly on two more disadvantages that we are seeing that, for example, um, on the composition, well, we already mentioned about the criteria, but also that um, it expresses that, for example, the, the composition would include representatives uh, with CEO uh, equivalent um, um, representation. So in that way, it would affect the representation of uh, small businesses. Um, this would be a key point to, to address. Um, and finally, that's well, it's mentioned at, at the Diplo website that the leadership panel should become more digital on their work, communication and focus. Um, and also that the, the outcomes will be shared to the community, uh, not using maybe this, this system of Chapman house rules, which uh, for us is, is concerning because we want to, to know uh, from which stakeholder is coming. I don't know, a certain policy or comment. And I I think I'm okay with my time. You can tell me one and I pass the floor to someone else. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you, Eileen. Thank you for those comments about the IGS blogs. Now we move into the follow the, the follow topic, the digital commons model presented by Mubashir uh, Sargana. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can okay. hear thank you. Much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'll just uh, start with a uh, brief about uh, digital commons that we are actually they are. Uh, digital commons are actually a form of uh, commons involving uh, distribution and ownership of uh, informational uh, resources and technology as well. Uh, 
resources uh, can be like typically designed to be used by the public and community and uh, those uh, are the creators of those uh, uh, assets or resources that the community is using examples can be wikis or open source software and licenses that uh, community create for their own use such resources uh, are uh, for the community uh, and people uh, building and uh, their in intervention uh, to govern uh, the interaction process and to deal with the uh, shared resources, how to manage them. Because uh, as uh, I've said, these are freely available and uh, people can use it, community can use uh, So there are some governing rules as well. I mean, in terms of so like, uh, if you, uh, if I, as I said, there are some public licenses under which they are governed, uh, they are used. Digital commons are, uh, they are actually used as uh, various types of uh, forms of licensing like uh, GNG, general public license, or the creative common license. These are two examples. If we come to our point that we are going to discuss, I think about uh, models, uh, possible models that uh, can be used uh, for digital commons. And uh, if we just talk about architecture, uh, uh, to develop the governance the solutions, uh, uh, they can be based on uh, commitment to safeguarding the internet in the common interest of multi, uh, multi interest to multilateral and multi stakeholder model uh, that we used in our that we used in our internet governance uh, paradigm. So the basic idea behind uh, this the digital commons model uh, is to ensure the integrity of the internet and the safety and security and stability of uh, technical infrastructure, but also uh, its standards and protocols uh, for essential digital are essential and uh, the most important sustainable uh, digitalization. And uh, moreover, it uh, can be for a purpose like uh, to safeguard the internet in terms of uh, uh, Maybe uh, due to some some of its uh, attached negative uh, consequences uh, uh, that we can uh, come across uh, while using internet or while connecting to the internet, because the people throughout the globe uh, connect with them and they access their freely available resources. Uh, moreover, it's uh, it's also based on the idea of. Uh, uh, like offering, uh, thinking about our discussion about the tracks of about uh, consultation or constellations of the different stakeholders uh, uh, to encourage our dialogue uh, about the current and emerging issues related to uh, the resources available online, uh, maybe uh, under some license or just freely available. Uh, there are some meetings. Uh, uh, also planned and uh, done annually or maybe uh, subsequent uh, whenever it's needed. Uh, discuss all these things uh, like uh, how to govern these issues and the challenges uh, that we can uh, and how to deal with them. What can be uh, done? Uh, uh, models that uh, we can do in uh, digital commerce. Uh, it's, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it's like uh, a widely accepted and well regarded concept and conceptuality that connects internet governance uh, related issues with the digital stability and sustainable, di sustainable digitalization uh, discourse and it's, it's obvious uh, that it's important for both technology and also uh, governance. While combining multilateral and multi stakeholder rights ensures that both normative approaches that safeguard the internet in the common of uh, international laws and internet governance, these both uh, aspects are at the same pace. And uh, if we just uh, sum up all these things, like uh, all these approaches that we uh, uh, this, we have been talking about 
there are soft laws and uh, there are some policies that need to be uh, developed uh, as we talk about the only uh, uh, internet uh, essence, essence, essence of uh, internet governance forum then uh, we should come up with the common laws and the policies that can be used to uh, talk about uh, These models are like norms to guide all the stakeholders that are involved and their respective responsibilities, how they are going to play their role and contribute in this whole process. Thank you so much. That's all from my side. That's all I'm watching here. Ness is Mary Bada Sajan. She's going to present the co-governance model. Please, Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Juan. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I will briefly recap the main features of the, co um, the proposed distributed co-governance architecture. Um, so um, co-governance relies on the uh, horizontal model for digital cooperation, which is uh, mostly used by such um, policy making bodies as IEEE, IETF, ICANN, and others. And the, one of the main features of this architecture is that it separates the formation of norms from it, their implementation and their enforcement. But at the same time, um, uh, co governance networks do not work as, uh, do not operate as governing. Uh, authority or and they don't have any enforcement powers, but they will uh, simply uh, follow um, a process that will uh, provide the governing um, agencies with some blueprint or framework for designing um, their policies, regulations or laws later. So co-governance consists of three functional um, elements. Uh, so the first one um, is the digital cooperation networks, uh, which would be this issue-specific horizontal uh, collaboration platform consisting of groups that will involve uh, stakeholders from um, all uh, interest groups. Um, and um, participation uh, in this network should be open to all stakeholder groups, as I mentioned, and special uh, efforts should be made to include and support uh, representation from de developing countries and traditionally marginalized groups. Um, and the function of these groups uh, would be would entail developing shared understandings, uh, goals for a specific digital issue, strengthening cooperation, designing, updating digital norms, providing norm implementation roadmaps, and developing capacity to adopt policies and norms later. The second functional element um, is named network support platform. So as the name suggests, these platforms uh, are only about um, uh, supporting uh, the processes by the digital cooperation networks. Um, these do not have any um, um, agency to interfere into the work product or composition of the self-governed and stakeholder initiated digital cooperation processes. They simply um, support the process to identify um, any emerging issues, secure commitment of relevant stakeholders, provide necessary resources and promote the outcomes. And the last one is network of networks. Um, and as the name suggests, it, uh, it is the one that um, does not have any top-down form of administration. It is simply there to loosely coordinate the activities of um, other decentralized co-governance uh, networks and the decisions are not binding. Uh, the network of network uh, consists of um, a support function uh, which um, is supposed to organize an annual forum, a research cooperative and norm exchange and a volunteer peer coordination network, which uh, would bring issues to the attention of the annual forum and follow up with its recommendations by promoting actions from specific stakeholder groups to uh, form digital cooperation networks. And um, going back to uh, my, pre my, my point that I made in the beginning, um, 
only when norms are available, the governing authorities may choose to establish enforcement and implementation mechanisms. And in, in the context of co-governance, when we talk about norm design, we mean identifying digital governance issues, forming cooperation networks and supporting networks to digital cooperation platforms. Then uh, after the norms are already available, we move to implementation and this entails developing norm design um, and adopting, providing a norm exchange to connect communities and offering implementation incentives. And finally, norm enforcement uh, is about developing norms into laws or regulations and adjusting, resolving any, any uh, conflict there, as well as establishing clear ground for digital technologies. So in other words, co-governance is a more horizontal architecture for uh, governance and it's one of the one of its main goals is to provide um, more um, equal footing for the stakeholder groups that were not traditionally um, very engaged in the IGF um, structures. Um, and um, it is about um, creating a process uh, for um, formulating digital norms and providing framework for further implementation and enforcement. Um, I think I'll stop here to allow more time for our um, discussion and uh, I look forward to it. Over to you, Juan. Uh, thank you very much, Mary. Now we going with Ethan Mudavanu. Uh, he will give us some insights about the, the, the cooperation between different regional perspectives regarding digital cooperation. Uh, thank you so much for, for allowing me this time. If you could just help me with the slides. Ah, thank you. So actually, um, I, I would like to, on, on, on the previous note, I would just like to start maybe by asking us all a, a question and um, we can keep it as rhetoric um, for the time being, but the question is, should the power to shape the internet be in the hands of everyone? And I'd like to reflect on a, uh, on in June 2020, the UN Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Gutierrez, he talked on effective digital cooperation. And in the paper that was uh, eventually uh, reported as the roadmap to digital cooperation, he said that what is instrumental in achieving uh, the future we want and the ambitious goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development um, is, you know, it's that something that any country or any company or any institution can achieve alone. Um, so I think therein lies the answer that we seek. It's, it's a cooperation, um, a, a collaborative effort that we should all be joining in. And um, I, I would like to share a few more on in terms of how the youth can be more engaged at a regional level um, in, into these kind of conversations. Um, but the first thing I guess to put out there is something that we already know. The ITU just recently released um, its uh, facts and figures for 2021. And um, it was shocking to see that the youth um, that is from ages 15 to 24 in 2020 used 71% of the internet. Right. So if we are the biggest stakeholder, why is it that we aren't as involved, as engaged when it comes to those issues around Internet um, and the governance of it? So that digital cooperation aspect of it, we should be as visible as we are um, as users. And you then find three things that I believe um, should be. Um, in, included in the conversation and considerations um, around developing regional, um, regional initiatives around digital cooperation. And I find inspiration from the recently released, I think it's two days old, um, by Youth and Policymakers paper on digital inclusion, and they highlighted um, access to opportunities. So this is the creation of sustainable structures for remote participation, capacity building, training, fellowships, um, and mentorship opportunities for the youth so that you can allow them to engage um, with the issues at hand. Um, and it doesn't stop there, it doesn't stop at education. It also includes defining policies that lay out how to ensure young people can actually attend um, 
the, the various fora and various meetings uh, for, for them to be engaged and for them to, to be a part of these kind of dis discussions. So that goes to a, to, to a more practical element. How can we actually get them to this, the, these, um, these platforms? Um, and the second one was around expansion or at least sustainable expansion of internet infrastructure. And that's simply saying the internet infrastructure needs to be expanded and emphasis should be put on community networks um, to facilitate the inclusion. And um, the last one was around diversity. You know, we are a diverse group as the youth uh, between ages, between race, between gender, cultures. Um, there are so many things that differentiate us and these should be incorporated in when it, with regards to how best we can make sure um, there's more involvement um, at the regional level uh, around these issues. So those are think, things to, to consider. Um, and what I will leave you with uh, above and beyond that is actually, if you are a youth right now, um, if you fall under the categories of, of a youth, um, or if you think you do, uh, if you're young at heart, what can you actually do right now? Where can you go? Which initiatives are out there for you? And um, we've broken them down from um, as, as, as um, advertised uh, to regional initiatives and some are IGF, some are outside IGF, but the point is really to get us going, get us doing something. And I'll just start by the Africa uh, section and we have your Youth IGF Africa, which is an open platform um, for youth facilitated by the African IGF. Um, and you find youth from many African countries there that are participating from Chad, Sudan, Morocco, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, Zimbabwe, from where I'm from. And um, there's also the African School of IG, AFRISIG, and um, which is about a five day week, uh, week uh, a five day, um, a, a five day course, if I can put it that way, but it's an annual meeting essentially that is um, born of a partnership between the AU, um, that is the African Union Commission and the Association for Progressive um, Communications. And really what they do is they facilitate leadership building processes and capacity building opportunities for us to be able to be engaging um, in, in issues around uh, the, the digital platforms and um, the digital use. Uh, rather the digital economy that we find ourselves in. There is in the Americas and Caribbean, we have the Youth uh, Six or the Youth uh, Observatory. Uh, again, a youth-led organization there, um, which is doing incredible work and has created, uh, it was created as a result of uh, Latin American youth engagement. And it's organized by um, ISOC, which uh, I'm coming to you as an ambassador of. Um, and the Brazilian Internet Steering com com Committee. So a bunch of things that they're doing, they're including editing and launching uh, books written by young authors around said issues and promoting digital education um, and the likes. There's also the Youth Latin American and Caribbean IGF, which you can be involved with. And um, it has been going on since 2016, I believe. And this, is, this initiative is, um, is independently organized. Um, so it's organized by a committee composed of members um, that fit a, the definition of, of youth by the IGF um, and includes other stakeholders as well. But it gives that regional balance. It gives that regional perspectives to what is going on and what are the issues that we're supposed to be tackling. Um, and it also gives that um, regional perspective also, which is important when tackling these issues and getting youth engaged. Um, and we have the Asia Pacific in the Asia Pacific. We have the Asia Pacific Regional IGF, and that provides a unique discussion platform for youth um, from different backgrounds, uh, as, as you would imagine. And um, it provides, you know, professional interest and organizers set up um, this uh, three to four day camp whereby more on youth engagement, more on education, digital education rather, um, and, and the skill sets that you need to be able to participate fully, meaningfully um, in, in, this, in this movement can be found there. Um, and in Europe, we have the European Dialogue on Internet Governance uh, or EuroDig. And uh, essentially there, it's, they have the youth dig events which foster uh, peer learning and networking among the youths that reside in Europe, of course, um, and discuss and exchange views uh, with experienced policy practitioners. So they're 
already is that multi-stakeholder um, aspect to things and um, different, uh, dif different groups, uh, speaking to different groups, although from a youth perspective and also gaining an experience from those that are, uh, are experts or are in that, the fields that, that exist already. So with that, there's the, the sub-regional, depending on where you are, there's the Southeastern European um, dialogue on internet governance. And essentially it's, it's basically um, making it more accessible to a particular uh, sub-region, but it's doing the same thing around uh, as, as Eurodig. So those are just a few of, um, of the initiatives that are out there. Um, and I do encourage us all to get engaged. Um, the, youth, the internet is ours. We are the biggest stakeholders. So um, I expect um, all of us to, to, to be more encouraged and um, to, to actually take this on. Okay, thank you very much, Ethan. Now we open this space here to question for any or speakers. And uh, also, who would like to take the floor can do it. have underway. But it seems to me that there is something much, oh, sorry, my name is Janice Richardson uh, from Insight and from the Dynamic Coalition for Internet Standards, Safety and Security. Uh, I've been researching over the past six months with industry to really understand what they need when young people come to work there. And so it seems to me that you are missing a very important link. Is the education that you're reaching to get, is the education that you want really the education that industry needs to continue to make the internet secure and safe. Uh, my research so far shows me that there is a huge gap. And I think that this is an area where young people should be working together to detect those gaps and to push education really to give them the skills or to help them uh, develop the skills that are so necessary if they're really going to have a loud voice in shaping internet. Thank you very much for your comment. If anyone want to follow, please can, can do it, any one of the speakers. Uh, hello, Mubashi here. Can you hear me clearly? We can hear you uh, clear, not so much clear as about well, better than before. Okay, I'll speak a bit louder. Uh, I, I hope it's okay now. That's fine. Uh, okay, I totally agree with the comments that uh, have been shared about the capacity building because uh, it's most important for uh, the youth if uh, we are interested uh, for them to come forward or to lead uh, activities that uh, some of them are, that we are discussing right now. Uh, national and regional initiatives uh, like uh, Internet Governance for uh, our schools of Internet Governance, they are uh, addressing this challenge to a great extent, but uh, the international fora like uh, IGF itself uh, is a great platform for this purpose. Uh, if we focus more on the capacity building of uh, youth through some programs that we can offer through IGF, uh, that will uh, uh, help this thing a lot uh, in terms of capacity building. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone else wants to make a question here on online, is more than welcome. Fred, we have a question online. Not yet. We don't have anyone who have raised their hand so far. Aileen, do you want to make some comment? I think, I don't know. I saw that you appear on, on the screen. 
Yes, thank you very much, Juan. Uh, I want to thank for for your comment on on the dynamic coalitions. Um, and I also agree with you that it's very important to bring these capacity building uh, tools to youth to participate because uh, when we are saying to participate, uh, it's it's a necessary step to get there first to bring the tools uh, to young people. Uh, so for us, well, many of us have been, uh, for example, involved in internet society youth ambassadors program. So for us, it has been our first step into the, the ecosystem, and it's also um, it's well, it's also other way to to engage. But uh, to be uh, truly engaged in the ecosystem, it's essential to have the support from all the other stakeholders. And I think we have uh, some raised hands. Nicolas can take the floor. I need to open it. Well, Nicolas Fiumarelli for the recording. <clears throat> Well, uh, from all the perspective of the models, I I am very happy to to see that. Well, this this idea of going from uh, <clears throat> from the local perspectives or national perspectives to the regional, and then from the regional to the global, I I found some uh, parts of each of of one of the models uh, that that has this this idea behind. And my my question or or my suggestion <clears throat> could be that 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 need to be like the general thing that. Where, or at least the, the youth uh, initiatives usually wants uh, this process to be really uh, hardened because uh, we we have not seen this in in the past. For example, in the regional ICFs, uh, sometimes it doesn't have in account, like for example, the what what the outcomes was uh, were from the national ICFs, and then the same happened in in the global ICF. So we we have some. Uh, uh, governance ideas of the regions, uh, or, or what the what are the interests of, of each of the regions, or, or comments, or, or opinions, or statements from different stakeholders. But at the end, maybe sometimes uh, there there is no like a, a like an ordered process to to join all, all these these comments or statements per stakeholder uh, to to have a sense of uh, what are the necessities or the or the problems or challenges of each of the regions, and then go into the global. So. I think that we we need to to find a, maybe a mixture of, of these models to try to to reach that that idea to to maintain this this bottom up process the most uh, uh, as possible. That is, thank you. Yes, I think you can go ahead, and then we pass to our other speaker. Thank you. I'm Kosi. I'm a senior one come from Benin. When we are talking about IGF and youth, and we are talking about the, co the, the stakeholders, youth are not possible to be for government, for civil society, and technical community in the same time. Every time youth are coming from something like end users, those civil society, we can say. When we have them on the table to discuss on their priority, is it to learn how is internet, how they can use internet for themselves, or just know the process, because we have three stakeholders in the table, this do that, another one do that, the third one do that. Is it only the information they need or they're supposed to ask for information we can use for themselves? What is the challenge exactly? Okay, if any other speaker want to take the word here. Oh. We have another question here in the floor. Oh no! Um, or comment. You can go ahead and and get responses, and then I'll just wait with my question for another moment. Or. All right. So I, I guess that's that leads me to it. 
Um, I, would, I would like to just firstly answer just at least my opinion from the, uh, the previous question. And I believe you have much more to offer than just um, a, an end user experience. I, I think we are at the forefront of um, the internet, which means um, its impact and its reach are things that we are so close to and come naturally to us. I mean, if you're talking about shutdowns and the effect of shutdowns on you know, new businesses that you know, we are, are blooming out out of the internet age, um, it's mostly the youth that would be affected by those things. Um, if, if you're talking about the different nuances to the internet, um, you know, it's, it's again youth who are at the base of the impact of it. So I believe there's much more that we can offer um, just um, besides how better we want it used, um, but actually how better it can be developed. Um, so, so there's those elements, but I also wanted to touch on quickly the idea around education and further from it is um, that, you know, there's still 2.9 billion people who are off, offline. 96% um, 90 of those are in developing countries. And the reason why I feel so strongly to speak on regional initiatives is even the conversations are different. So if we're speaking about education and 90%, 96% of a particular group, say maybe in, in, in Africa, are still struggling to even have broadband internet that allows them to come to forums like the, these, um, or at least that, that gives them that awareness and level of education to be able to use particular aspects of, of the internet. Um, then there are different conversations happening across the globe. And again, my emphasis is that's where regional initiatives should come through and come strongly because the conversations are different. How to educate the, the, the youth in, in the South America um, is different from how to educate youth even in North America, um, at least what their needs are. So I, I, I really think that there needs to be a, a focus on um, the, the conversation, uh, the initiatives and um, the priorities that region, regions are facing and how they can be tackled. Um, so that, that's my contribution. Thank you. Hi, my name is Demetria Lee, and I work at the German Informatics Society that uh, put on the Youth Times Policymakers um, program that was mentioned earlier. Um, and our sort of international group of about 45 participants uh, published policy papers, again mentioned in the session um, at YIGF. De this this week at the beginning of this week, um, and I guess my my question is primarily directed to you, Ethan. Um, you know, we worked with such an international group of young people, and I'm curious to know how we could have maybe done a better job of making these regional differences a little bit clearer, even within this very global group of young people. Yeah, th thank you for that. Um, so I think there are two things for me. Um, I, I, I really do believe in, um, in silos or rather in the uh, parallel workings of, um, of, of initiatives, right? So if you're talking about regional initiatives and the likes, um, them working as individual regions and coming up with solutions, coming up with the questions that they're facing and the solutions, Right, and then bringing those to a global conversation, um, I think brings a much clearer perspective and a much clearer um, idea of um, how we can actually move forward. Because what we then find is conversation shifting or, or an urge um, to, to just get to a global uh, picture um, whereby we can point to X, Y, and Z and say, okay, this is our global, our harmonized even um, term um, you know, approach to a particular issue. Whereas I'm saying, I think we just need to, we need a little more focus on the grassroots level. If we can spend a little more time on really just my, my neighbor um, and my neighbor's neighbor and making sure that we completely understand their situations, their, their concerns, um, and then bring that up. I feel like the bottom up process is moving too quickly, if I can put it that way. 
So more emphasis, I think, needs to be on um, the, the ground root level issues and um, how we can tackle them before we even get to a global IGF um, or a global platform or global papers. Um, so th that's, that's, that's what I, I, I would say. Um, but I think beyond that, there's uh, a saying that I used to, to love, which says it's better to, um, to, to build boys than to repair men. And um, it really is the idea of um, how do we make sure if we are thinking about, you know, I, like I said, I, I, I enjoyed your paper. If I'm thinking about um, what, what are the issues and what are the potential solutions, um, I think at the back of my mind should always be the idea of how do I make sure that the five-year-old um, uh, in, in Soweto somewhere or in, in, in Kenya somewhere, whatever the issue may be, um, can be uh, equipped to, 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 uh, to use the internet meaningfully. Um, and as long as at the back end of that, it is that five-year-old boy and not necessarily um, me, uh, uh, maybe you and I, um, I think we can get to the answer quicker and more effectively. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, if we have um, more questions, please do it now because we are getting close to the hour. I see that two people raised their hand on the chat. So if you want to speak. Elin can go first. Uh, thanks, everyone. I will comment very quickly because I know we are a bit short of time. So, for example, um, well, uh, it was mentioned um, the, the question about um, the education part. Um, there, there is something that we always discuss at the governance that I'm part of is that generally um, it was like one, I think, the very first topic that emerged uh, and was part of the conversation, but we also want to emphasize that under the, the youth uh, representation and the, the youth uh, people, how, how to say it, uh, we um, are very interested in all sorts of topics, not only about youth participation on, or education. So that's something that we should uh, keep in consideration. Uh, that's why it's also important that today, for example, we are discussing about digital cooperation and in a while we are discussing about cybersecurity, cybersecurity, sorry. So that's also a way to see that we are not only focusing on one aspect of internet uh, or just one, one stakeholder. Um, going back to, to the comment on having youth as, as a stakeholder, it, we thought that um, having this uh, new actor in sort of way, it would also give us um, a better recognition. That's why I was saying better recognition, also a true voice to, to speak up because otherwise we usually fall on the, um, on the discussion that we are end users or part of the technical community. And even for example, within the technical community, they have uh, different discussions. So that's something that we should keep into consideration that it's uh, open the discussion within each stakeholder. Um, I, I want to thank Demetria for mentioning about the, the policy papers. And I think this is something very useful for, for us also to bring our messages there. Um, yeah, I will stop speaking now and giving the floor to Mary. Thanks, Eileen. Um, I mainly agree with um, most of the comments uh, made by my uh, colleagues already, but just uh, my two cents before we conclude. Uh, so I remember when I joined this community like five, six years ago, we have, were having the same discussion. Is you the separate stakeholder uh, or is it a part of other stakeholder groups? So there is no need to have a specific uh, youth stakeholder group. So. Um, my reflection for the last five, six years is that there is a need to have a separate stakeholder group because this is not about, um, you know, um, it, it's about having a seat at the table, as Eileen mentioned. Uh, otherwise, my reflection is that the youth just um, gets um, swallowed by other stakeholder groups and we are everywhere that is true. We are part of all stakeholder groups, but we present a specific perspective and that needs a separate seat at the table. 
Um, going back to the question on education, uh, yes, I would say there are gaps. Nothing is perfect in this world, including education. Um, but um, again, this is about uh, having a seat at the table. So having a specific um, perspective from youth, regardless of how prepared they are, um, is um, important in itself. Um, and finally, on regional versus global tensions, I would say that uh, um, you know everything on global level needs to make sense on the local uh, level, which is the most, impor most important and also most challenging thing uh, that we deal with on a daily basis on all uh, or across different issues. Um, so definitely agree with Ethan that uh, it is, and also uh, with um, Nicolas that we need to um, you know, invest in more grassroots initiatives, uh, but also think how this all will make sense on a global level. Because if we, uh, you know, um, go on a very global abstract level and this doesn't make sense on the local level, I don't think we are moving forward uh, with anything. Um, so important to balance um, um, what we are doing on all levels and cooperation and synergies is what we should strive for. Thank you. Over to you, Juan. Okay, thank you very much for this insightful conversation about cooperation and how you should be involved in this in the distinct co uh, conversations in internet governance, especially as a, a stakeholder. So as we don't have in so much time, if anyone wants to give a small conclusion about it, uh, can, uh, can do it now. If it doesn't, well, we finish. Okay. I think it's a link one to make a last a statement. Okay. Um, well, I, I just um, I just comment very quickly uh, because I don't want to miss the opportunity that, for example, uh, well, uh, myself and other colleagues like Nicolas Fiorelli, who is with you on on, on site. Uh, uh, we organized last year, for example, the, the with the internet um, in cooperation with missions publics. Um, these run this sorry these global uh, dialogues with citizens, and in part of those uh, dialogues, we included uh, citizens into the discussion uh, of digital cooperation and many other topics. So uh, I think it is important to remark that this topic uh, shouldn't be only closed. Uh, to just a circle of people, it is important that everyone is equally uh, participating and have their voices heard. So yes, I will stop my intervention here and thank you very much Juan and everyone. Okay, with this comment we finish this panel and thank you very much to everyone here on, on site and everyone online. Right. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, everyone.